of your word, it's dynamic and it's vibrant and it grasps things in us and lays hold of us. And we pray today that that might be our experience of you and of your word, that you come amongst us, knowing us the way you do, knowing what's in our hearts and minds, knowing our weakness and our failure and our difficulty, and the things we're struggling with, perhaps even now, in here. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us and you'll help us to understand from you what you'd have us say today and the way you want us to proceed and the way you want to rearrange furniture in our lives to live in line with your truth. Mm. Help us, we pray, to be in that sweet spot of your favour. And help us by speaking to us through your word, by your spirit. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, are we rolling, Harris? Yeah. Superb. <laughs> last week then, last week we saw something of the trouble Samson got into with women. There was that prostitute down in Gaza, shouldn't have gone there. There was Delilah. But Samson's been on his road before. There was that Philistine woman he tried to marry before, and so on. His life is characterised by the fact that he has a taste for what's bad for him in women. Now, he could have been a woman with a taste for what's bad for her in men. We're not saying that, but we're saying this area of his life is not under control. And he's got fairly well on in his life and is still under control. <coughs> and that's a bad thing. In spite of his phenomenal physical strength, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he didn't have the discipline to say no either to himself or to these women. And also, he seems to have loved to play with fire a little bit. He seems to have loved playing with fire. In all of this, Samson is a living picture of the weakness of the people of Israel in their flirting with the culture and therefore the religion of the Philistines. Drawn astray by wayward tastes, unable to say no, either to their own wayward tastes or to Philistinism. That is a word. Philistinism. And with a tendency to think that they could play with fire without burning their fingers. Let's be quite straightforward. You cannot play with fire without burning your fingers. You can't walk through a muddy field without getting crap on your boots. Why do we think you can? Samson's already proved otherwise on a number of occasions. And is now a blinded prisoner down in Gaza and shackled in the temple of Dagon as a trophy. What a picture. When the people saw him, they praised their God. Judges 16 verse 21. Saying, our God has delivered our enemy into our hands. The one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. Our God, Dagon. Dagon has been shown to be the serial god and chief deity of the Philistines. They were more than a little bit keen on him. And the very sight of Samson is what causes the Philistines to praise Dagon. The very sight of Samson, God's champion, shackled and blinded, causes them to praise their pagan deity. Because, they said, Dagon has delivered their enemy Samson into their hands and they've gathered to celebrate that. That's why they're having this festival. How does it feel when your personal failures bring disgrace on the name of your God and give rise to the exaltation of idolatry? Can you see where Samson is? Can you see the disillusionment and the disappointment and the despair? Can you see that? It's possible for Christian leadership in old age to be characterised by disappointment and disillusionment. Often because of weakness and sin. How does it feel when your personal failure is being disgraced on the name of your God and give rise to the exaltation of idolatry? How does it feel? Oh yes, 
Your God has the power to organise things otherwise, but you just couldn't say no to yourself or to someone else that you grew infatuated with, who has betrayed and has destroyed you. A leader of Israel? Ha! Samson. He knows he's been very foolish. We often do have limits, don't we? And his situation is utterly desperate, as blind Samson is called upon to be taunted at the revels associated with his pagan deity and to show the supreme superiority of Dagon to Israel's God, as they suppose. A supposed superiority which only arose because his bedfellow's bitter treachery got Samson delivered over to the Philistines in the first place. And the Philistines were enjoying it and they were celebrating it large. Taunting Samson. While they were in high spirits they shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison and he performed for them. Baiting a bear with the dog. Samson is the freak in the freak show. But it's not a freak show, it's a festival to show the superiority, supposedly, of this pagan deity. Oh, they're enjoying it. He who spent his life painting disgrace on the Philistines has painted disgrace all over the face of his God. And it all goes to show, doesn't it, the importance of living your life faithfully so that you can finish it well, because it is possible in the last five minutes to undo a lifetime's good work. At this point, Samson looks like he's messed it all up. But Samson is a God-made hero. God has made that man a hero. Scripture in Hebrews talks about the courage that's born of faith. We don't talk enough about courage. Let's do that for a minute. Courage is born of faith. Now we can all do the courage that, well, I speak for myself, a number of us, I guess, salute smartly and charge us up the hill in a moment of crisis. Yeah, we're up, yeah, we're up for that. I'm up for it. I'm up for any amount of that. I love that stuff. That's great. But Samson has got to be quite thoughtful quite calculating in this situation. It's cold courage. He's not in the heat of the battle. He's not in the heat of the moment. He hasn't got a red donkey's jawbone in his hand. And he's not, you know, hand to hand with Philistines thousands at a time. This is the courage that's born of faith that is thoughtful, cold, in that sense. The warm-hearted towards God. Samson is a God-made hero, and Samson hasn't been quite finished off yet. It's very important to realise that, isn't it? It ain't over till it's over. <laughs> and his last five minutes are going to be quite something. Because as you know very well from verses 25 to 31, Samson's next trick is to bring the house down. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple. More about those pillars in a minute. So that I may lean against them. He's not lying. He's not lying. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof, I'll show you the roof in a minute, were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. And then Samson prayed to the Lord. Sovereign Lord. Ruler, one in charge, capital letters for Lord, covenant keeping God. God I can trust, remember me. Remember me. Please God, strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines and my two eyes. And then Samson reached towards the two central pillars on which the temple stood. Morning. 
and bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one, the left hand on the other. Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Oh. And then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. And thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. He doesn't tell us what to say about that. You and I are not called to that. Isn't that good? But he was. And then his brothers and his father's whole family went down again and they brought him back and they buried him between Zorah and Eshterah on the tomb of Noah his father. He gets a good burial. He gets what a pious Jewish person would see as the approbation of God at the end of his life to be gathered to his fathers. He led Israel for 20 years. Not many people led Israel for 20 years. There's a picture of some sort of redemption restoration going on here. How does that come about? Well, the Hebrew text is very clear in its description of the actions of Samson. The text reads that Samson grasped the two middle pillars that supported the house of the temple. I can read you the Hebrew. You don't want to know. One with his right hand on and one with his left hand on. And he, he bends his back and he lifts and he pushes. What's going on? Oh, behold, the temple of Dagon, your delectation and delight. We've got two particular sites that have been dug up that tell us about what these temples look like. This is the excavation of the pagan temple at Tel Kassile, uh, which is now part of the Eretz Israel Museum in Tel Aviv. So if you're passing by on your holidays, drop in. The Gaza temple of Dagon hasn't been excavated, and the reason for that is they built Gaza on it. So it's a bit of a snack. <laughs> Can't exactly get to it that easy. Uh, Gaza is a bit of a, uh, you know, at the moment, politically, it could be difficult. Wood, in his history of Israel, suggests that the Gaza temple must have been very similar to the one at Tel Kassila, so we've got a parallel. The Bible describes the Gaza temple as having two pillars supporting the roof. See on that? See in there? What have you got? Two pillars and about... Two pillars at Tel Kassila support, support walls. Supporting the roof. Yeah, bear with this a minute, because they've got to span that distance between those walls, kind of, and that's why they've got pillars. The Bible writer seems to have known his facts when he writes that down in Judges 16, 24. There's the Bible. It looks like the report that we're getting, what Samson did, is the report of an eyewitness. And, and there you are, but the artist's re reconstruction of the uh, temple at Tel Can you see the numbers? Mm -hmm. Ten is a street outside. Um, there's a courtyard. One and nine in the courtyards. There's a stone threshold, number eight. There's an entrance room, number two. There's a main hall, number three. There's wooden, these wooden pillars, number four, resting on stone bases. And there's a raised plastered platform, number seven, steps. And they found Celtic vessels around there, something going on there. And then six storage room for discarded Celtic vessels, and then a little auxiliary shrine and stuff. Ba basic things we need are these. Two pillars, roof, courtyard area. Top Street looked to scale. Just can't imagine 3,000 or something people on that roof. The issue is the question of scale. Now, obviously, they've got this sort of setup by various means, but those two pillars seem to be something to do with the cultic, whatever's going on, because they are repeated all over the place. Um, let me show you. There's the dig, and there's the pillars. And that's a different one. That's uh, Kiryat Gath, that is. But again, there's that in Kiryat Gat, and then there's this, this is Tel Kassila. These are the pillars. And when the archaeologists excavated, they left those things in place. They excavated on down through the floor to find what was there. But these pillars seem to be in place with wooden going up. So something to do with the cult in this space here, there are these pillars, which support the roof. However else, the wings of the roof are supported. That's how that was done. And the pillar bases of Tel Kassila are about two metres apart which is well within the reach of a tall guy. So, that first part of the description of what Samson's doing here is consistent with the excavated temple. And the text then reads that Samson bent powerfully, it says, in his effort to dislodge the pillars. The Hebrew term, natar, bend. Um, it's bending under a force of effort, I can give you examples of that in Genesis and Numbers. And then, the word used in conjunction with that word for bend is literally in strength. So he flexes his back with power, and strength, high potency operation, and then 
hits all these pillars and he lifts and shifts. He just lifts the pillars and shifts them off these bases and dumps them down off those bases. And of course that gives you know, a pull on the roof and the roof comes down. There's not, the, there's not the dynamism in the structure of the roof to take that, especially with thousands of people standing on this big roof and it creates a disturbance in the plane of the roof and down comes the roof. And the roof falls on top of the VIP box beneath the roof where the lords of the Philistines and their cronies are all sitting watching the entire entertainment of the taunting of Samson and the disparaging of Israel's God. Three main conclusions, perhaps, to draw from the revisiting of that temple issue. First, it's clear that linguistic evidence supports a side of the debate that sees this all as an historical account because we've got the temples, we know how the architecture worked, we know how he's done it, we've seen. Secondly, it seems likely the story of the destruction of the Gaza temple was actually made, described by an actual eyewitness or a narrator who, who knew the school, who'd been and seen. Thirdly, the combination of the findings at Tel Kassila and the specific wording of the text, the way it's worded, it describes Samson's final act in a way that validates the historic historicity of what's happened here. It looks like this is realistic. The structure of that temple at Tel Kassila we were looking at on the slide has been dated to the early 10th century BC. It's the right sort of time. It's about right. Leading up to that time when the rise and fall of Philistine power takes place, David in the 11th century BC and, and so on coming after that and defeating them conclusively in the, in, the, in the future after the days of Samson. Only one who lived in the time of the judges or the early monarchy would have been familiar with the structure of these temples. We're looking at something being written between 1200 and 1000 BC and that just gels up with the time in which Samson lived. It's like an eyewitness account from around the right time rather than the creation of later storytellers or later biblical authors. So we're saying the world in which Samson lived looks like it was real and so was his strength. We do a job like that. Now that's all very interesting, isn't it? That's all very faith affirming and whatever, but, but for our purposes, just consider what this was, what this act was, not from just a physical, but from a spiritual perspective. Samson has sinned. The sinful habits of his life have brought him to a point. And it's brought him to a very, very low point. Where he has been kind of clobbered by, by the results of his actions and sin is weighing heavy on him. But, but look at the impact on the, the name of his God. And he's done that. He's done it him, he's done that. First look at Samson's situation. He gets himself into that situation where he's betrayed, blinded, so that looks like the end of his Philistine bashing ministry then, he's finished for the ministry, and bound in Gaza. But, but it's so much worse than that, because he's become responsible for the name of his God getting dragged through the dirt. That is a higher order situation altogether. Absolutely more than any believer wants to get into, ever. So that's his situation. What are his priorities in that awful situation? He's blind, bound, taunted, disappointed with himself. Disillusionment cannot have been far from his door. But when he works out the lair of the place he's being tormented in, where his God is being mocked, when he works out who is where in that building, there's this lot on the roof, and there's the lords of the Philistines down here, and architecturally, hang on, there's two pillars here. Once he's completed his structural survey of the edifice, checks on his own haircut, he's not yet down and out. He's going to finish, but he's going to do it well. He's going to do it well. And God has called Samson to clarify the boundaries for the Israelites by engaging the Philistines, doing it single-handedly. He's still called to that. One big last effort then. The opportunity's there. Samson is ready for one more huge heroic effort that it will cost him his life. Gone are the days of the, the hot-blooded stuff. This is <coughs> cold-blooded, courage born of faith. And it will cost him his life. But God has called Samson uniquely to this role of bashing Philistines. And for him, repentance 
turning away from your sin, turning to embrace God and His plan for your life. For him, that's repentance. For Samson, practical downward repentance is demolition shaped. Now, perhaps there are those of us who in our more boyish moments wish that God had called us to a career in demolition, right? Why, wow, yeah. But that's not what this is about. This is not really smash something. This, in the providence of God, is the way that he's dealing with those who oppose him profoundly. Who would dis bring disgrace on his name. They are beyond redemption. They are up for judgment. And you know, as far as Samson is concerned, repentance really costs. Sin is expensive, right? It costs you. And correcting it by repentance also exacts a price of us. But it's still the way to go. And Samson died disgraced, derided, and alone. He had no way of knowing whether his family and the people who mattered to him would know the real achievement of his last few breaths. He didn't know that. He had no idea how awful his last moments would feel, crushed beneath the weight of the collapsing temple portico with all those Philistines on it. He couldn't be sure, he really couldn't see very much that his plan was actually going to work. And he almost certainly died without knowing the effect of what he'd done. But Samson was back on the hymn sheet. And it can cost. It can take extreme heroism to do that. This is extremely heroic. The flawed hero, Samson, got all things straight in there in the end. He finished well. In his time, according to his unique calling from God, he finished well. And so ends the life of the last of the judges. After 20 years judging Israel. Personally, as Michael Wilcock points out in his book on this, Samson issues a dreadful warning to all of us. Because he was a man of enormous potential. Who never grasped that the Spirit's call to holy discipline is even more important than the Spirit's gifts. Is that a dangerous thing to say? Spirit's call to personal discipline is even more important than the tremendous gifts that he's got. Gifting is no uh, way of dealing with a lack of discipline and walking with God. Being able can be a snare. Seems to be the him. Because all the time he was indulging these weaknesses of his, he was getting away with it by just coming out and picking up the city gates and walking off them. There you go. Covering his sin. Covering the the implications of it, the, the outcome of it, by his gifting. <coughs> Charles Simeon, the 19th century Cambridge preacher, brilliant guy, put it like this. Verily, there you go, that's verily thrown in every now and again. Verily, he says, the fetters of brass did not form a stronger bond for his feet than ungoverned passions make for the souls of men. Isn't that interpreted? I really, you do. <laughs> you know, his unfettered passions, that is, in his own selfish, simple self run riot, was more of a, an imprisonment feature than the bronze fetters round his feet. Even reason and common sense, says Simeon, appear to fail the persons who are under their influence. Even reason and common sense have gone. So what are we to make of Samson, the man of God? I'm very, very glad that you know, we live in a later time. Yeah. And, you know, God hasn't been calling us to go out and be in a Philistines. It would be cool. It would be cool, though, do you that? <laughs> yeah, but no. <laughs> yeah. Samson's living in a particular particularly difficult time, when there is no government, there is no state, there is no safety, there is no protection. These people live in tents, not walled cities, remember? 
And God has called him for something absolutely unique in a difficult, awful, bad situation. <clears throat> First of all, then you won't get Samson at all unless you reckon on the fact that he's living in a time long before God's fullest revelation in Christ, in the age of the Spirit, with a completed Bible. Now that doesn't lead us to minimise Samson's bad habits, but God has been dealing progressively with human beings down the ages, teaching us what sin is, showing us how to deal with it, using the resources that he provides. Gordon Kelly again says, The Christian of the New Testament has more light than Samson ever did. More light than Samson ever did. But, truth to tell, he still has the old, same old darkness clinging to him. If anything, we've less excuse because we're given far more. Firstly then, you won't get Samson unless you realise he's living in a very different time from ours. Secondly, no real Christian can fail to sympathise to some extent with Samson because we know the power, we know the hold of, of sin and bad habits that we've got into, how we can have a hold on us. Again, that's no excuse to sin. But we have to be realistic about it. We have to have our responses to the sins of others conditioned and designed for us by our common need of grace. That idea presses on me a lot. We need to understand and relate to others, conscious of the power of sin and human. How it presses on us. Thirdly, it looks to me as if the Lord very clearly reveals to us in Samson the folly of trusting in our gifts as if they were something we produced or developed ownership of. You can take a haircut if you try and do that. Be aware there are times when the good parent allows the child to fall in order to have them realise what it is that enables them to stand. A good parent will allow a child to fall so they realise what it is that makes them stand and God can do that with us. Samson fell an awfully long way with me. Because he'd been relying perhaps on his gifting and ability to cover up the effects of his sin. And it comes a point where God says, well, Let's see how you stand with that. So it is with the Lord of heaven and earth then. He may allow us to fall in order that we realise there's no strength and no gifts that will enable us to stand outside of our humble reliance on Him. The Bible calls this faith. Yeah? We've got to watch our hearts. Because the best of gifts will fail us, but the one we trust never will. What do we make of Samson? Fourthly, shortening this. Fourthly, God seems to design Samson not simply to draw a line in the sand against the Philistines. A line the people of Israel had not observed, which had led them to just becoming like the Philistines all around them and wandering away from them. God seems also to design Samson to sum up in one perfect flawed hero the weakness of the people's relationship to God in the time of the judges. We identify with the people who are amongst as well. Sadly, we soak up too much from them. Very clear warning to people of later generations after Israel had found peace. And we've got to learn fifthly the importance for overall usefulness of a life that is faithful to God's call mm -hmm. so that we can finish well. Because it's very dicey to think that you can live a life that isn't faithful to God and yet still finish well. Do you know a terrible thing? Mm -hmm. I've seen that sort of thinking fail so mm -hmm. I've seen it more than once. It's the habit of a life that's built as a life is lived faithfully, that enables a man and woman to finish well at the end. This man is the last of the judges, but again, as Kenny points out, Samson's trumpet calls not so much the last post, but the revali for an era of significant spiritual reformation that's coming on the back of his work, which he will never see, but which God is going to do, because he's been undone with That's his call 
once more to us in our time. When the Philistines quiet conquest of God's people as they lay on their backs waiting for their bellies to be scratched, poses as great a threat to us now as it did to them in the days of that flawed, uber-gifted hero, Samson. <laughs>